namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa the quality of upeka or equanimity is very crucial for spiritual progress. It has a number of different aspects. One list in the Vasudhimaga lists ten kinds of equanimity. The first way we could break it down is equanimity as a feeling, a vedana, and equanimity as a mental formation, sankara. Equanimity as vedana, as a feeling, is the simplest kind of equanimity, the most basic. It's a synonym in this case for uh, dukkama sukham, neither pleasant nor painful, the mental aspect of Vedana feeling is one of the five aggregates, and it is the initial emotive response to sense contact, and it's a resultant, it's automatic, it always occurs, it's not something that's really under our control and it's something that has no ethical bearing it's just a reaction we touch something with our eyes ears nose tongue or body you know sight sound or whatever then we perceive it as pleasant or painful or neutral and we have this feeling of happiness or sadness or a neutral feeling. I think that if we were able to keep track of our feelings, keep a running total during the day of every moment of our, and keep totals going for pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, I think neutral feeling would by far exceed the other the other two most things are just boring old neutral that's just the the way the our reaction to the sense world works the important point here from perspective of practice is to be aware of the neutral feelings uh, if a person is not fully aware of the pleasant feelings, that leads the mind to fall into the defilement of sense desire. If they don't see the pleasant feeling as just a resultant, just a feeling, then it can it can spiral into the next stage of dependent origination, which is craving. And the same sort of thing works with unpleasant feeling, which leads to the defilement of ill will or aversion, which is basically just a negative form of craving. You just don't want it. So these two are complementary opposites of each other. They work in a similar way. If neutral feelings are not attended to, then this leads to ignorance. And if we're practicing mindfulness, if we're trying to do vipassana or just being generally mindful during the day, not attending to the subtle impressions that don't yield a strong feeling, that are neutral, this tends to a dullness of mind and a sense of, of uh, boredom. It's worth considering that 
Equanimity as a feeling, neutral feeling, is not defined as absence of feeling. It's a feeling in its own definition. It's a type of feeling. It's a neutral feeling, equanimity. And I'm not moved to pleasure or pain by this occurrence. It's a neutral feeling. So that uh, equanimity as a feeling, or as a vedana, is the most rudimentary or basic type of equanimity. All the other types of equanimity we could classify as sankara, as mental formation. And the um, first division here would be between equanimity towards persons and equanimity towards dhammas or phenomena. Equanimity directed towards persons is the fourth Brahma Vihara, divine abiding, the divine abiding of uh, Upeka. Divine abidings or boundless states are metta, karuna, mudita, upeka, loving-kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy, and equanimity. And the first three are variations on a theme. Metta is benevolence or a feeling of wishing well. So it's a kind of generalized love. Karuna, compassion, is the wish that beings not suffer. So it's a bit more specialized of a feeling. It's directed towards the suffering aspects of beings. And mudita is its complementary opposite, directed towards the pleasurable aspect of beings. May beings continue to be happy. These states, the Brahma Viharas, or divine abidings, have an association with the Brahma worlds. Another title or name that's given to them are the boundless states, Apamana, states without boundary, because they have to be universal. If they're the spiritually effective state, then it has to be universal. You can't have compassion for some beings and not for others. It has to be indiscriminate in this way. It has to be universal. And these first three, they have the the aspect of an aspiration. May all beings be well and happy. May all beings be relieved from suffering. May all beings continue to enjoy whatever good fortune they have attained. And these formula are often given as definitions of these states. And it's one form of practice is uh, repetition of the, the, the aspiration as a mantra. So they involve this kind of aspiration, whereas upeka is different. It stands alone and it's separate from the others and in a sense it purifies and transcends the others. When the Vasudhi Maga talks about developing the divine abidings, it treats upeka as kind of like a graduate school. You first you have to master one of the other three before you can properly do a peka. I think that's a bit rigid. I think it's uh, worthwhile to develop all four at different times. I think it's a kind of a wrong approach to say, well, I haven't completely mastered metta, so I can't even try to do a peka. Opeka is different from the others in that it does not involve any kind of aspiration.
So it transcends the others. It's in a sense, it's a more pure form than the others because it's at peace with the way things are. It's holding the same feeling towards all beings indiscriminately. So it's recognizing that aspect of beings which is universal. The traditional formula is given in terms of kama to just recognize that all beings are the owners of their kama, heirs of their kama, abide supported by their kama, and receive the fruits of their kama for good or for ill. So here is no aspiration, may they be relieved from suffering or enjoy the good fortune that they have, but simply a recognition they're suffering or they're enjoying pleasures due to kama. So there's a neutrality, there's a calmness, a recognition of things as they are. and an acceptance of all beings. All beings are simply the way they are in existence because of their burden of their kama. It's obviously that the multitude of, uh, uncountable multitude of beings there are in existence of all different kinds and species and varieties There's a great diversity among beings, but the quality of opaca cuts through all that and simply recognizes that which is common to all beings. There's some aspect of beings that is universal. Ultimately, we could say it's a citta, that all beings possess the, of citta. And Upeka is also non-judgmental. Upeka doesn't discriminate in beings in terms of this one is good, this one is bad, this one is worthy, this is unworthy. It just accepts all beings as they are in all their variety, yet the unity of their basic nature. So, we can see that that's a, a much more subtle and um, probably difficult state of mind to maintain than one of the other Brahma Viharas. But it transcends the others. It's, it's considered to be a higher state than any of the others. Then equanimity towards Dhammas is that kind of equanimity that's directed towards individual phenomena. This goes even beyond the idea of beings. It's looking at momentary dhammas as they arise, of whatever kind they may be, and being equanimous about them, meaning clear and unmoved. So here this ties into the uh, concept of equanimity as a feeling tone, because if you have equanimity of dhammas, then the feeling tone will be neutral. You won't be moved to pleasure or pain. You just see the dhamma as a, as a phenomenon. And just as with... Um, equanimity directed towards persons, when equanimity is, is directed towards dhammas, our attention is drawn naturally, if we're equanimous, our attention is drawn towards those aspects of phenomena that are universal. It's even more so than the case of beings. Individual dhammas have a vast multitude of variety of possibilities. They can arise at any of the six sense bases. 
They can be strong or weak. They can be uh, near or far. They can be wonderful or terrifying or boring. You know, there's all sorts of varieties, too many to list. An incredible variety, of, a cascade constantly of, of various phenomena presenting himself to consciousness. But cutting through all this variety, ultimately in the analysis into the three characteristics, they're all empty, they're all impermanent, they're all imperfect. This is the constant nature of all phenomena. And this reveals itself to the mind if the mind has this equanimity towards phenomena. Think of the, the metaphor of the uh, kaleidoscope. This is a really good metaphor for the variety of phenomena and the, the way the mind treats them. Kaleidoscope is a children's toy. It looks like a little telescope and you turn the handle and uh, you get different colored patterns, pretty mandala-like images. But if you were to take a part of kaleidoscope and see how it works, it's just some mirrors and bits, little bits of colored glass that slide around that reflect in, a, in this uh, radial symmetry. You can make these mandala patterns. And the phenomena that present themselves to the mind is an infinite variety of these mandala patterns. But if you look underneath, they're just rearrangements of the same basic elements. It's like you've got three pieces of colored glass and some mirrors. You've got you know, red, green, blue, impermanence, voidness, and suffering. And they're shifting around reflected by the mirrors of the, the senses and the mind and they make all these patterns and if we're focusing on the patterns these mandalas the mind is caught up in them lost in them and is prone to the opposite poles of attachment and aversion fascination and, and fear you know, it's pulled this way and that, jerked around. But if that's penetrated and the, the inner workings are seen, it's, oh, okay, that's just another variation of emptiness and impermanence and suffering. It's not, it's not to be fussed about. You know? then, then the mind is seen with equanimity, equanimity of dhammas. And this has a couple of specific applications to Vipassana meditation. One is the aspect of equanimity that's called Tatra Majitata, specific neutrality, or literally being in the middle about that. You know, tatra is an emphatic kind of um, adverb that means you know that specific thing. So it's not a general kind of equanimity, a kind of fuzzy, non-attentive, you know, everything's, everything's the same, one big undifferentiated soup. It's not like that. It's being keenly, specifically aware of individual phenomena, but being unmoved by them, being neutral. This is that. You know, that is whatever is occurring to the mind at this moment. So that's the specific part. And then the neutral part is non-reactive to it. That is just as it is. It's nothing special. You know? That's a problem with the mind is we tend to make things special. Right? It's, um, that's prevents us from having a smooth, uh, penetrative insight. 
if you're trying to develop insight, it's good to remember a maxim that nothing is so trivial it can be ignored and nothing is so important it needs to be held on to. When everything is treated exactly the same, that specific neutrality, that's being in the middle about that, tatra majitata. And when the vipassana is proceeding properly, it goes through a number of different stages and eventually settles and reaches the stage that's called equanimity about formations, which is the second aspect of equanimity that directly relates to meditation. Equanimity about formations is the defined and special stage of, of uh, vipassana. When the mind has gone through all its turmoil and difficulties, and it comes to this resting place. This is not yet awakening. It's not yet nibbana, but you could call it the, the launching pad or the, the, the landing place. This is the only state of mind from which nibbana can be realized. Mind's gone through all its various struggles and turmoils and come out the other side. And it's just resting in perfect equanimity. And at this point, there's no feeling of effort in the meditation. There's no feeling of struggle. It doesn't even really feel like you're meditating, like you're doing anything particular. You're just sitting there but you're not missing a thing. So this has uh, been called undistracted non-meditation. Also diligent effortlessness. The mind is, in one sense, meditating perfectly, in another sense, you can say it's not meditating at all. It's just sitting there, present with all phenomena that arise. And this state is particularly marked by the profound equanimity. The opaque here is very strong and established, and the mind is not disturbed by anything that might arise. It's not moved to any kind of strong emotive reaction. They're all just phenomena. And this is as far as striving or effort can take you. There's nothing to do at this stage except just sit there. In the Vasudhi Maga, there's a metaphor or a parable about this state of mind. It's like a mariners at sea and in ancient times they um, they carried along in the ship a caged bird usually a crow they called the a land finding crow it was a navigation aid basically when they thought they might be close to land they were way out in the sea crossing the crossing some depth of ocean and they thought they might be reaching the far shore they would release the bird from the cage and they would watch which direction he flew and the bird would look for a landing place. So first he'd fly, say, north. Then if he found nothing, he'd come back to the ship and rest a while. Then he'd try again, go off to the east and the west and the, you know, the south. And at some point, he would not come back and they would know that, that he had found land in that direction. So this is the the mind in equanimity of formations is like the ship that's left the near shore, has not yet reached the far shore. And every now and again the mind goes out. And if it doesn't find the far shore, it just comes back. But eventually it alights upon the far shore. It 
realizes nibbana and it doesn't come back. So you could say this equanimity of formations is in a sense a perfection of equanimity. It's the highest development of upeka. Upeka is something we should be striving to encourage at all times to have a more balanced, equanimous approach to things and situations, other people, our life in, in general, to have this unruffled center, this equanimous, even center that we operate from. And things become more clear. When we're not in a state of equanimity, then we're being confused in some way by passion or fear or anxiety. We're having an emotive response to phenomena that confuses us and pulls us in what can be harmful directions. But if we're quantumous, then we can judge phenomena for what they are in their own nature as they occur and deal with them. So these are some remarks on a few of the different aspects of equanimity. And I may am Dhamma Kataya Sadhu Kalam Dharma Say Sadhu 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 Sadhu